This talk is about how our team at Zoncake changed uh, our code and our culture during an intensive rewrite project. So we're going to go through the lessons we've learned uh, and our approach to that project. Um, then I'm going to show you some code and how we actually implemented those changes. Uh, and I'll use the A word, so don't fear. Um, and to finish, I'm going to talk about how this project changed our company's culture and how we work. So, um, as I said, uh, I work for Songkick. Uh, this is a story about Songkick. We're a live music company helping fans around the world go to more concerts. We launched a new version of the website way back in 2009, um, and in the following years, we were happily building new features, experimenting with the product, uh, and seeing its popularity grow, and it was all very exciting. But then, over time, we noticed that it was taking longer and longer for us to release new changes and new features to our users. So, you don't have to see this. Well, let me look at what it looks like. Oh my god. So this is a graph, uh, it's a great visual representation of the mess we're in. Uh, this is a dependency graph of our projects and libraries. Um, so any change to that top project uh, with all the lines coming off of it, we would have to make sure we didn't break all the other projects below that depended on it. You had to have a lot of implicit knowledge about the code base. Uh, it was very hard to make changes. It was basically hell. Uh, so yeah, small improvements to the code base weren't cutting anymore, and something drastic had to change. So we made the decision, which is quite popular nowadays, but maybe not so much when we did it. So kind of like a hipster architecture, because I'm from East London. Um, so the decision was, to go to a service-oriented architecture um, and break up the code dependencies by splitting the domain into services and having each product, product having some front-end app using those services. So it's been over three years since we made that decision uh, and we're much more productive nowadays. Uh, so now I'll share with you some of the lessons we learned about going through and finishing a rewrite project like this. So the first one is to know your product. Uh, sometime before the rewrite project started, uh, the product team at Songkick was working really hard to find out what Songkick's main proposition was. Uh, we had a bunch of features related to live music uh, that we built over the years, but we wanted to find out what was the main reason users came back to Songkick. And after a lot of user research, uh, we found out that it was to track their favorite artists so they never miss them live. So the most important feature for Songkick is to have all the events that are happening all over the world uh, so that we can notify the right users about them um, and they can buy tickets. So we built our iPhone app uh, built based only on this proposition and it was a big success from the start and still is. So we knew what our product was. We also knew that we wanted to go from here to here, a lovely sunny end state uh, with a diagram, this is a diagram that we drew at the time of what we wanted the future to look like. Uh, and as Caroline said yesterday, you know, if you don't design your data model, you know, having a service-oriented architecture will only break up your code and add latency to it uh, and make you even slower, which is so true. Um, but we understood Songkick's products and our domain models, so we knew what the end result looked like. But we need to start somewhere, right? We're not going to just arrive at this, this lovely destination. So how do you decide where to start? So for us, you know, the start, we decided to start where it hurt the most for us and was the, the best place to start for, for our company. Um, because a rewrite is a very risky project, uh, so it makes sense to start where you see the most benefits the quickest. So this was our end goal for the rewrite project. We wanted to iterate quickly on the website, so our Rails application. So we started that there by pushing the complexity down and hiding it behind Ruby service classes. Uh, this would also give us the opportunity to understand the resources and the API uh, endpoints that we needed so we could later use that knowledge to build us HTTP services. And as you can see, we weren't trying to, oops, sorry, to change everything at the same time. At the end, we'll still have, you know, we'd have the Rails app in a sunny, happy state uh, where we can make changes quickly, uh, but we would also have, you know, the legacy code and highly coupled projects below that. But that's fine. Because related to that, you know, one thing that we've learned is that it's really important to have one specific goal for your rewrite project. You know, we knew that if we simplified, and this was the goal for our project at the time, so we knew that if we simplified our website, 
uh, to implement Songkick's main proposition, our users wouldn't go away because that's what they were there. Uh, but we weren't making changes for them. You know, improving our velocity was our main reason for doing this project. And, and the reason for having this one specific goal is that you know, the possibility of starting over is very exciting. Um, it's really tempting to try to work on everyone's favorite features and issues and problems and trying new technologies and doing everything uh, perfect and new uh, and thinking that this time we'll get everything right. Uh, but this lack of focus makes it very difficult to actually finish a project like this. And having one goal in mind made it easier for us to focus and reject unrelated changes. So this lesson was very hard for us to learn, which was to have an explicit, to explicitly define the full project scope and have a clear deadline. What we ended up doing was writing down every single feature that we wanted to keep on the website. We estimated roughly how long that would take, and then we figured out that it would take way longer than we could afford. <laughs> so we ended up going back and removing more features uh, until we had a manageable deadline. And even after we had that, we would reevaluate re that deadline every week and check that we were still on schedule. Uh, and then we would simplify and delete even more features if we needed. For us, at the time, having uh, a new feature was less valuable than have, like, moving fast again. So during those, that project, we didn't add any new features. Until we finished, it was either rewriting or deleting. And speaking of deleting, you know, <laughs> deleting is faster than rewriting. Um, we analyzed data about how features were used at Songkick, but we also had input from the development team about which areas of the code were really hard to maintain. I mean, personally, for me, it was very hard to delete features that I really liked uh, and I used a lot, but I know I'm not an average Songkick user. So knowing your product gives you the confidence of knowing which, what is okay to delete without you know, scaring your users away. Another decision we made was to rewrite the application on master and just not start a new project, rewrite it on the same project we already had, and releasing as we progressed. We would pick a page at a time, rewrite it completely, and release it to our users. This way we could validate the new architecture that I'm gonna talk about in a bit, that's the A word. Um, and it also forced us to improve our release process, moving towards continuous delivery. Um, and a shout out to Joe Wilk, who's here. He used to work at Songkick at the time, and he was our biggest advocate for continuous delivery, so thank you, Joe. Um, and then another lesson that was very hard for us was to learn to iterate. Like when you're used to a very slow release pro process, it's hard to forget or to, to learn that you can go faster. So when we started this project, we were progressing really slowly. Every change still had to be manually tested by our testers, and every small decision on copy and design uh, had to be reviewed by our product manager or a designer. So we had to realize that um, a release cycle is just more than software development, and we needed to make changes more than just to our code. And one way that we found to reduce this bottleneck is to give developers more responsibility about testing their own code and making decisions about copy and design. So if you give developers the right context and trust them, you can trust them to make the right decisions, basically, and own the code and product quality. So those are the lessons. I'm going to talk um, a bit about our new front-end architecture. Not so new anymore, but that's what we rewrote the application to be. Uh, that allows us to iterate quickly where we needed the most. So here's the lesson. I promised myself I would add to the presentation because uh, they are one of my favorite bands and they're from Melbourne and they were playing just before the break so it was kind of a sign for me. Um, so this is Songkick's event page for the last concert um, and as I said the rewrite was an iterative process. So the way we would do it was we would pick the, our most popular pages first uh, in our case, this is the event page. And then for each page, the developers who are rewriting it would get together with product managers and designers and define and name the page and all of its components. So a component for us is a discrete module functionality on a page. And you can see them, you know, the pink boxes around those name areas. And they function independently of other components. At the same time, we would also remove or simplify the unused or complex features on that page. 
so yeah, this is a pretty straightforward Rails app. So let's see, it looks good. Yeah, kind of does. <laughs> um, so I'll talk about a couple of new modules that we've created in this new architecture in relation to the event page and the event brief component, which is the one at the top. So the way we would rewrite it is starting with a controller. You know, we just simplify it a lot. You know, all the action method is doing is instantiating a new page model, which is the Ruby class representation for that page or that template. The page model itself has methods to create its components and get the data it needs to display or the actions it needs to perform. Uh, and here's the brief component defining the presentation logic for that component. And, and as you can see by default, a, a component belongs to one page. So one thing that we decided is that if we're building a new page that needs a component, unless it behaves uh, and it looks exactly the same as one we already have, we would create a new component. Uh, and we are very happy to have that duplication in the front end code if it means less, less if statements and less checks and reviews and less CSS overrides. This has greatly reduced the number of presentation bugs we have. So here are the templates for the page. Again, you can see with the consistent names across the, the files and the CSS classes and the Ruby classes. And each page and component has its own style sheet and JavaScript associated to it and images, all with the name of the component or the page. So by defining those uh, components and pages together with designers and product managers, what we created was a shared language that was used from the idea to the code base. Uh, this means that we have a shared understanding of what we're building, and it makes it easier to talk about things. I mean, it sounds very simple, but it's really powerful. And this consistency naming also makes it easier for a new developer or someone due to the code base to, to find a way around the code. So if someone says there is a bug in the event brief, even if I don't know where it is, I can expect to find something like that in the code base. A fast release cycle also needs a fast build, so our build used to take hours to run, parallelize, and after the rewrite, it's running in under a minute, and our end-to-end -end tests are running at around five minutes. So how do you do that? You delete tests. Uh, <laughs> so the only end-to-end -end kind of integration tests that we kept uh, were the ones that our tester and our product owner picked, uh, and then decided that would give them enough um, confidence that we wouldn't break Songkick's main proposition. All the other tests were either rewritten as unit tests or deleted. A slow build discourages refactoring. You know, we should try to make a fast release cycle so that the cost of making small changes is very small and we can keep refactoring and improving our code base. To cope with fewer, the risk of having fewer tests, we set it up uh, error uh, logging and monitoring so we get alerts uh, with, when sudden error spikes happen and we also have a daily error email that we get and we try to keep on top of those. So at the same time that we were rewriting that, um, our controllers and views, we were also trying to go through our first step to our service-oriented architecture. So if we had a controller with an active record model like this called event, we would uh, replace that with an application-specific client model, uh, and that class would call a service instance to get the data that it needed to instantiate itself. This service class was the only one that was allowed to talk to active record models, and the active record model itself would define a, a method that would ret ret set the data it would return. So starting out like this meant that we could easily change how the services and the methods and the data it returned because they were still in the same code base. And we could also iterate and improve those services until we got it right. And at the same time, we already had the benefits of encapsulating what would eventually become the service client code. So when we had the HTTP services running, implementing the same API, we could just replace it and finish the decoupling, which we did. Um, you know, after three months, uh, we had a decoupled rewritten Rails app with no downtime, the users were still there, and it had immediate benefits to our velocity. Uh, the rewrite finished exactly three years ago, so you can see the spike there in the number of releases, but it was also like a graph of our happiness. So I'll talk about the cultural changes that this project uh, brought us. So during those months, we were working closer together with designers and product managers to help each other out to finish this as quickly as we could, because no one wanted to stay there very long. And through that collaboration, we changed our own culture. We had a better understanding of each other's parts of the product development process puzzle. Um, you know, we felt more comfortable as developers suggesting simpler solutions, and designers and product managers understood the risks involved in implementing the ideas they had. Sorry, I missed those two, but there you go. Um, 
So the culture and practice, you know, our culture uh, is translated into our process. So I already spoke about our shared language, our small releases, and how we favor iterating over product development and design. Uh, and here are two more examples of how this changed the way we work. Uh, so we used to have features that were uh, fully formed, uh, delivered to developers. You know, the product manager and the designer would uh, think about it and define it after weeks of discussion and then tell the developer, just build this. Now we try to bring developers much earlier in the idea development process so we can understand the context and give feedback early on. Features are defined during what we call kickoff meetings with developers, product managers, testers, and everyone that's involved. Uh, and that allows to everyone, to ever, for everyone to raise questions and um, collaborate and define what it is that we're trying to build and understand why we're trying to build it. The other thing that uh, made a change in our process is that you know, instead of getting PSD files, we now have designers and developers pairing and writing code together. You know, as the designer at work put it, you know, by pairing with a developer, the browser becomes the artboard. Um, developers are really happy because we can ask questions and give feedback really easily. Uh, and designers are happier because it gives them an understanding of the code base uh, and what's possible to achieve. It also encourages the wider team to uh, get involved uh, in the way the product looks and feels. So I think that's most of what I had to say. But to finish it off, you know, I think having a clean code base is just a means to an end. You know, if you have a perfect ar architecture but it's for no one, it doesn't really matter that much. So the reason we're doing this is to deliver great products to our users. So my advice here is to learn to collaborate and work in a multidisciplinary team. You know, get closer to the product and business uh, teams at your company. Help them understand how you work and what's important to you, but also learn how they work and what's important to them. You know, having a better understanding of how your work fits with others can help you do your own work much better. You know, for us at Songcake, working in, in a multidisciplinary team made us happier and we are delivering better products and it even improved our code quality in the process. So I will recommend you try it out. Um, yeah, there is lots more I can talk about this. Uh, come talk to me afterwards. Thank you so much for having me. It has been great. Thank you.